Hello and welcome to this lesson on nuclear fission, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at explaining the process of nuclear fission. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we can describe what the process of nuclear fission is. We can construct a chain reaction diagram based on nuclear fission, then we can understand the different types of chain reaction in nuclear fission, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification. 3.8.1.6 mass and energy. Now in the previous lesson we've defined the concept of binding energy in nuclear physics. So the reduction in mass as nucleons turn into a nucleus is called the mass de uh, defect. Now this mass defect can be converted into a potential energy value by using our equation delta E equals delta mc squared or you can work it out in the value of MeV by using our equation delta E equals delta delta M in U times by 931.3. Now, this energy difference between the combined energy of the free nucleons and the bound nucleus can be emitted to the surroundings during the process of formation. So this energy difference between the between the combined energy of the free nucleons and the bound nucleus is called the binding energy. So the binding energy is the work done to overcome the strong interaction attraction between all the nucleons in a nucleus. So the binding energy is the energy needed to separate all of the nucleons in a nucleus into its separate nucleons. However, in a nuclear process, the total binding energy does not indicate stability as not all nucleons are separated. Only a few nucleons are removed in a decay process. So a better measure of stability in nuclei is the binding energy per nucleon, which is the work done needed to, to remove one nucleon on average from the nucleus, which is similar to a decay event. Now, the higher the binding energy per nucleon of a nucleus, the higher the stability of the nucleus. So, because iron has the highest binding energy per nucleon in the universe, this makes its nucleus the most stable configuration possible. Now, all nuclear events such as fission, fusion, or decay wish to increase the binding energy per nucleus of the nuclei. Now the greater the increase in binding energy per nucleon in the nuclei, the greater the increase in stability, so the greater the energy released by the process. Now fusion has a greater increase in binding energy per nucleon than fission, so each fusion event releases more energy than each fission event. But let's consider what fission actually is. Now uranium is a very important element in the universe. It's the largest naturally occurring element. So it's the element with the largest nuclear nuclear radius and is the element with the largest binding energy in the universe. Now physicists consider that if uranium is the largest nucleus in the universe, could we add to this nucleus to make even larger elements? Could we in fact transmutate uranium? Now, in 1938, the physicists Hahn and Strassmann bombarded the uranium nucleus with neutrons. Now, these neutrons were accepted by the nucleus, and the physicists were eager to analyze the new elements that were formed. So, we thought that fame, fortune, and new entry in the periodic table awaited. Now, just to clarify, a neutron was used as it only has the strong attractive force and not the repulsive electrostatic force, allowing it to lower the binary energy per nucleon even further. However, they discovered that when with that actually there wasn't any larger elements present but there were actually many lighter elements such as barium present after the bombardment even though that the uranium was pure before and there was no heavier elements so there could only be one conclusion that the uranium nuclei was split into approximately two equal fragments of nuclei now this process increased the binding energy per nucleon of the daughter nuclei so this process increased the nuclear stability of our daughter nuclei so what the two physicists had discovered was the concept of nuclear fission, which we're going to cover in today's lesson. Now, in nuclei larger than iron, they have a smaller binding energy per nucleon than iron. This means that the nuclei are not as tightly bound, so the nucleus does not exist in a lower energy state. So this makes our nuclei unstable, and so the nucleus could carry out radioactive decay, such as alpha decay. However, the radioactive decay would still leave the nucleus with a lower binding energy per nucleon than iron, so the nucleus could still become more stable. So the nucleus could carry out an extreme form of decay. It could split into two fragments, 
it could carry out nuclear fission. So what nuclear fission is, is our large uh, nucleus with a large nuclear radius split into two smaller nuclei which are more stable because they've got a smaller nuclear radius and they've got a higher binding energy per nucleon. Now the aim of the nuclear fission is to increase the binding energy per nucleon of the nucleus and the difference in binding energy is given out in the nuclear fission process. So energy is released. Now in the fission process some of the mass is lost in the fission process so the total mass before is greater than the total mass after. So this mass is converted into energy by our equation delta E equals delta mc squared and given out in the fission process. Now the energy tends to be released in either the form of kinetic energy of the particles released or in the form of gamma photons. Now the nuclei produced in fission exist in a lower energy state than the nucleus at the start. So this excess energy is shed by the nucleus and given out in the process. Because again remember the aim of nuclear fission is to increase the binding energy per nucleon. So to understand how fission works, we've got to consider the complete process. So consider one unstable uranium nucleus. Well, a neutron is then fired to this uranium nucleus. Now the neutron is accepted into the nucleus because the neutron will be accepted because it provides an extra strong force with no electrostatic repulsion. Now this neutron will induce fission, so we call it induced fission. Now only low energy neutrons can be captured this way. Now we call a low energy neutron a thermal neutron because the neutron is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings. Now on rare instances nuclei can fission naturally which we call spontaneous fission. Now the larger the nucleus the more unstable it will be so large nuclei are more likely to spontaneously fission. Now spontaneously fissioning limits the number of nucleons that a nucleus can contain so it limits the number of possible elements. So like we mentioned before for a neutron to be accepted in induced fission the nucleus must be travel at a particular speed. Too fast and will smash straight it through the nucleus. Too slow and will not be able to get close enough to the nucleus. Now the addition of the neutron to the nucleus makes the nucleus extremely unstable. Now the added neutron lowers the binding energy per nucleon. The increase in strong force is not offset by the extra mass so it makes the nucleus more unstable. So we've now got an even lower binding energy per nucleon and an even more unstable nucleus. The uranium nucleus then splits into two smaller nuclei. Now the two smaller nuclei have a higher binding energy per nucleon which makes our nuclei more stable. So we've increased our binding energy per nucleon for each of our two products. Now heavy nuclei do not always fission to form the same daughter nuclei. The uranium can split into lots of different pairs of nuclei with numbers of nucleon numbers of around 90 to 140. Now, it's important that we've increased the stability of our nuclei in this particular process. Now, this process will also produce lots of energy. Per kilogram, there's about a thousand times more energy this way than by combusting coal. So now, nuclear fission process, energy is released. So the excess energy shed by the nucleus is given off as energy. Mass is turned into energy, and this is equivalent to the mass lost in the process. So energy is released to the surroundings due to the mass deficit principle. Now, it's important important to note that this energy released in fission okay, is what is used to heat water in power stations for nuclear power stations. Now this energy released in fission is found initially in the form of kinetic energy the products in the event or gamma photons. Now we can work out the energy released in this particular um, nuclear fission event by doing delta E equals delta mc squared or we can say the energy released in MeV is the mass defect in U times by 931.3. So let's look at a particular example. So very large atoms are unstable because their nuclei are too large to be held together by the strong, the short range strong nuclear forces effectively. Taking away the nucleons therefore increases their stability, binds them more tightly and releases energy. So find the energy release when the uranium-235 nucleus undergoes nuclear fission according to the following equation. So the first step is to calculate the masses in U before and after. Then the second step is then to calculate the mass defect. So what you would do is in your mass defect, you would uh, work out the mass of the nucleons afterwards, 
okay, and you work out the mass of the products, sorry, of the um, reactants before, so therefore you find the difference and we get our value in U. We can then calculate our binding energy by times an hour um, mass difference in U by 931.3 and we get that in MeV. So in this example, we found that each uranium nucleus releases 173 MeV of energy when it fissions. Now it's important to note that there's lots of energy released per kilogram in nuclear fission because whilst one fission event produces little energy via the mass defect, there's so many uranium nuclei fissioning in one sample of radioactive uranium, the total energy released is very large. Now the fission process also produces three neutrons in this it, when it splits as well. Now as the fission process are linked in a chain because these neutrons will go on and then fission other a uranium nuclei, we call this a chain reaction. Now only uranium-235 nuclei will fission, uranium-238 nuclei do not fission. So it tells us that the greater the amount of uranium-235, the greater the amount of uranium fission that will be carried out. Now we can artificially increase the amount of uranium-235 in a uranium substance, and we call this enriching uranium. Now why does uranium-238 not uh, fission? Well if a neutron encounters uranium-235, it will be absorbed and become uranium-239. Uranium-239 can then beta decay into neptunium-238, and then neptunium-238 can beta decay into plutonium-239, but you don't get this fission process. So, the capture of a neutron by a nucleus of uranium-238 leads to the formation within a few days of a nucleus of plutonium-239, which actually is also fissile. Now, the nucleus of uranium-239 resulting from the capture of a neutron is, is a radioactive beta minus uh, emission after that. So, by emitting your electron and antineutrino, it can become neptunium, which then becomes itself unstable and transforms in the same way to plutonium-239. Now, plutonium can also fission, and this allows extra fission to occur in your fission generator. Now the amount of plutonium produced needs to be monitored in a nuclear reactor in case it can cause the chain reaction to increase. Now we've got to consider what's going to happen to the fission rate in this chain reaction. So let's assume each fission when an event releases three neutrons when it takes place. So when you start off with one neutron being fired at the nucleus, you'll then get three being formed. Now each of those three neutrons will then find a nucleus and each of those nuclei is going to produce three neutrons in the fission process. So it goes to 9, then it'll go to 27, then it'll go to 81, so on, so on, so on. Now this is what we call an uncontrolled chain reaction. There's been no measures taking place to change the fission rate. So what will happen is in this case we call this a supercritical chain reaction because each time in each step of the process the energy released by the mass defect is increasing so eventually it'll produce so much energy that the reactor will explode which we call a nuclear reaction. So it's an uncontrolled chain reaction. At each step of the fission chain, the fission events are releasing a greater cumulative amount of energy. Now, it's important to note that when the energy is released and is large enough to actually melt the uranium fuel rod, we say our chain reaction is in meltdown. So nuclear weapons can contain an uncontrolled chain reaction. So we've got to be very careful about how we carry out these processes. So we say, like we said before, our chain reaction is super critical. So this occurs when the fission rate increases exponentially. And this will happen naturally after a process has been induced and nothing's been monitored. Now, we've got to control our chain reaction by trying to ensure the number of neutrons fission in uranium stays consistent. So again, if we consider that each fission event releases three neutrons, we can we can stop two out of three, causing further fission by encountering other uranium nuclei. So we can go from one to one to one to one to one. Now, if this happens in a nuclear power station, we say that the power station is producing power at a steady rate. So the process has gone critical. So the mass of uranium needed to do this is called the critical mass which is it is very good so we say at this point our chain reaction is critical and this occurs when the fission rate stays constant this actually happens when control rods are placed partially into the reaction chamber now if measures are needed to stop the chain reaction process all of our fissile neutrons must be stopped from encountering the uranium so it'll go from one to one and then eventually stop so if this happens in a nuclear power station the fission process stops and no more energy is released by the fission process so our process has gone subcritical all the engineering in a power station is to ensure this takes place when a nuclear power plant goes into emergency shutdown so we've got our chain reaction being subcritical so this occurs when our fission rate decreases and this will happen when the control rods are 
are placed fully into the reaction chamber. So let's have a summary of our different types of chain reactions for the fission process. So if you've got a subcritical fission chain reaction, the fission rate will decrease to zero. Now this is achieved by fully placing control rods into the reactor vessel and the chain reaction ceases and no more energy is released. You have a critical chain reaction where the fission rate remains constant. Here you can place control rods partially into the reactor vessel and you get a constant supply of energy released, while supercritical is when the fission rate increases exponentially. This is allowing the induced fission process to occur naturally and putting no measures in place to halt it. You will then get enough energy released eventually to cause a nuclear meltdown. So in our lesson we should have hopefully looked at both the fission process and we'll look at the fusion process next time and we'll have simple calculations from nuclear masses of energy released in the fission reaction. So if we've been successful and we've learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to describe what the process of nuclear fission is, construct a chain reaction diagram based on nuclear fission, and then finally understand the different types of chain reaction in nuclear fission. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on nuclear fission, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.